ऐसा बोल रहा हूँ वन एंड वन हाफ मिनट अल्हम्दुलिल्लाह, वसलात वसलाम अला रसोल्ला वाल साहब अजमैन अम्माबाद अबिल्लाजीम बसमीम कुल होद अल्लाद लम यलिद वलम यलिद वलम यकुल हुकुफ़नहद रब्बी शहरी सदरी व यसली अमरी वहलुल उगदत मिल लिसान यफ कव कौली आई वेलकम ऑल द व्यूअर्स ऑफ द पीस टी वी नेटवर्क ऑफ पीस टी वी इंग्लिश द पीस टी वी उर्दू द पीस टी वी बंगला द पीस टी वी चाइनीज एंड माई फोर सोशल मीडिया प्लेटफॉर्म्स विच आर फेसबुक द यूट्यूब चैनल the instagram and twitter i welcome all the viewers with their islamic greetings assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh may peace mercy and blessings of allah subhanahu wa taala of almighty god be on all of you i would like to wish a ramadan mubarak a very happy ramadan to all the viewers i am at present in malaysia and this is the 5th of ramadan and in most part of the world today the 5th of ramadan in some parts like the indian subcontinent india bangladesh pakistan it is the 4th of ramadan and i pray to allah subhanahu wa taala that may he make our this ramadan better than all the previous ramadan and i pray to allah subhanahu wa taala that may we come closer to him and we follow more of islam during the month of ramadan and continue doing it after that Before I start my short talk for today, I would like to remind you that you can write down all your questions. You can text all the questions that you have on a WhatsApp message to plus six zero double one two six nine five three eight nine five. I repeat, you can text all your questions. and also mention your name the city and the country of origin as a whatsapp message to plus 60 11269 and last time when i was live on last saturday about 3 days back alhamdulillah in a span of one and a half hour we received 2327 questions only on whatsapp and we received more than 206000 messages comments on the facebook out of which more than more than 20000 were questions and we received another few thousand questions on the youtube so overall we received more than 25000 questions out of which i was only able to answer 14 of the questions last time i spent about half my time giving a talk and half a question answer session this time inshallah i'll make my talk short so that we can entertain more of the questions and it's impossible to answer 25000 questions in a span of one and a half hour even if i give one and a half hour every day in the full year i will not be able to complete all the 25000 questions all those who want to ask questions they can even ask ask on their social media on the facebook on the youtube but it becomes difficult for us to select questions from the facebook and the youtube because there are too many and it's not that well formulated so if you the so if you want your questions to be asked there are more chances if you text as a whatsapp message if you are on the facebook if you write on the facebook yet there are chances last time majority of the questions two third were from the we picked up from the whatsapp messages a few from the facebook and a couple from the youtube this time too more than 2/3 maybe 70% would be from the whatsapp messages a few would be from the facebook the question is asked and maybe a few also from the youtube again before i start the talk you can text your questions you can start texting your questions as a text message on whatsapp with mentioning your name the city and the country of residence as a whatsapp message to plus 60 
I repeat, plus six zero double one two six nine five three eight nine five. The topic for today's short talk is let isolation draw you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our last episode's topic was Ramadan during lockdown, and we had discussed the various disadvantages of lockdown and when we ask people what is the maximum loss and damage done by the lockdown most of them say there is economic loss to the to the country the businesses are going in loss the loss of employment but according to me the maximum loss that this lockdown has done is closure of the masajid the mosques for the public to pray their five times salah <coughs> This, according to me, is the major drawback, the major loss of this lockdown where more than 50% of the world today, majority of the world today, is facing a lockdown and most of the mosques throughout the world, throughout the world are closed down. As, and today, and this Ramzan would be different than all the earlier Ramzan because of the lockdown. What I can think of, there are four negative factors as far as our activities in Ramadan are concerned because of the lockdown. Number one is we will not be able to pray the five times Salah, the congregational Salah in the mosque. Number two, we will not be able to offer the Taravi, which we do in the month of Ramadan. Number three, we will not be able to perform Atikaf because performing Atikaf, one of the criteria is it should be done in a mosque. And number four, we will not be able to perform Umrah in the month of Ramadan, though a very small percentage do it. But we can always turn the tables over and let this lockdown be a benefit for us if we are careful and if we pay proper attention. Inshallah, we can convert this negative factor to a positive factor because we know that we cannot do etikaf, where one of the requirements is a mosque. Now we are locked in our homes for the complete month of Ramadan. Even though we cannot perform etikaf for the last 10 days, those who do, this time all of us at least, are there, most of us, are there at home. So you can say there is isolation for the complete month of Ramadan. And it may not be the same as etikaf, but because the period is three times more, inshallah, inshallah, we can try and convert it to equal blessing, equal benefit, or maybe even more, depending on how we perform and what activities we do in the month of Ramadan. So let us discuss today the various important acts that a Muslim should do in the month of Ramadan or try his level best to do. And some of them, because of isolation, may be beneficial, some may be not. But overall, inshallah, if we pay attention, we can convert it into a beneficial incident, this lockdown. I'll, I will not be discussing all the things that we should do in Ramadan, but I'll try and highlight the major things in order first the Faraiz, then the Mustahab, the Sunnah Mokida, then Ger Mokida. I'll try and list at least more than 40 important acts that a Muslim should do in the month of Ramadan. Number one, we have to generally in Ramadan, as far as possible, pray five time compulsory salah in the mosque. It's a fard. Most of the scholars agree it's a fard. Some go to the extent, like Imam al Dhabi, he says that if you do not pray in the mosque the five time compulsory salah without a valid reason, it is the 65th major sin in Islam. But now, because of the lockdown situation, inshallah, Allah will not hold us responsible that we cannot pray in the mosque because they have been closed. But we should see to it that we should at least pray five times salah during Ramadan in Jama'ah. 
at your home. And jama constitutes even of two people. Bigger the better, but minimum two. It can be with your father, it can be with your brother, it can be with your son, it can be with your mother, it can be with your wife, it can be with your daughter. See to it that the family together prays. And the women folk who normally most of the time may not be going to the mosque in Ramadan, at least now they have an opportunity to perform jama. So for the women, it will be good that they'll be offering congregation, inshallah, much more number of time than what they should do before most of them. And see to it that you perform salah on time. There are high possibilities that even those people who go to mosque, when they have to pray at home, they procrastinate it. They delay it. Okay, we have to pray, you know, we have four people, five people together. What's harm if you delay and then you keep on delaying for half an hour, one hour? You may even delay till just before the time of the next salah, which is which is makru. Where the Prophet said you should pray as early as possible. So see to it that you pray all the five times compulsory salah in the house in Jama as early as possible. The moment you hear the adhan or the moment your mobile rings for the time for salah, as soon as possible, make the salah and pray in Jama. Number two. That all of us, the Muslims, we should fast during the complete month of Ramadan. Except those who are excused, those in menstruation or those who are sick or those who are traveling, there are exceptions. But as a general rule, all the elders Muslims should fast the complete month of Ramadan. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it mentioned Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, hadith number 1901, that anyone who fasts the complete month of Ramadan with sincere faith, and seeking the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all his past sins will be forgiven. Number three, all those who have to give zakat, see to it that they give the zakat. If they have not, Ramadan is a good month, though it's not compulsory to give in Ramadan, but Ramadan will get multiple times more sawab. And zakat is the third pillar of Islam where every rich Muslim, adult Muslim, who has a saving of more than the nisab level, more than 85 grams of gold should give 2.5% of that saving every lunar year in charity called the zakat. Number four, all of us Muslim should ensure that we do not do a single haram activity in this month of Ramadan. We abstain from all the major sins and even the lesser major sins as well as all the minor sins. This is the best time of the year where you can abstain from some of the sins which you do and you cannot stop. This is the best time. Take the opportunity. Abstain from 100% all the sins, whether major or minor. Number five, besides praying the five time compulsory salah, the first salah, you should ensure that you also pray the sunnat e muqadda our beloved prophet muhammad said that anyone who offers 12 rakah of salah besides the first salah he shall get house in jannah and these 12 rakah of sunnat e muqadda are the two rakah sunnah before the fajr salah the two plus two four rakah sunnah before the duhar salah the two rakah sunnah after the maghrib salah and two rakah sunnah after the Isha Salah. So the total there are 12 sunnah de muqadda. So besides the 17 fard plus 3 with the 20 rakat, even pray these 12 rakat that is 32 rakat of Salah. In Ramadan, see to it that you do your suhur. Some of us, they have dinner and they sleep and they don't get up for suhur because they don't disturb their sleep, which is not appropriate. Doing suhur is what the Prophet recommended and you should do it. Number seven, that see to it that the suhur is done as late as possible just before the Fadar Adhan. Many people for security and safety, they stop few minutes, maybe 10 minutes before, 15 minutes before, 20 minutes before, but delaying the suhur as late as possible just before the Fajr Salah is recommended. Same, while you are breaking the fast, the iftar should be as early as possible. The moment the sun sets, you should break your fast. 
and a beloved Prophet Muhammad said that my Ummah will be on the straight path as long as they hasten in breaking the fast and they delay the suhur. So hastening in breaking the fast is a very important sunnah. It is recommended. Many of us say that for safety, you know, we will break the fast maybe five minutes late or three minutes late. There is no logical reason for that. And especially now in the age of electronic age, there are watches available, there are mobile phones available. And especially now, since we have smartphones, you can link the time of your phone to the satellite. So there won't even be a delay of a second. So once you know scientifically when is the sun going to set. And if the time is up, why delay for 5 minutes or 3 minutes? The moment the time is up, hasten so that we follow, hasten breaking the fast, so that we follow the recommendation of our beloved Prophet Muhammad While you break the fast, the Prophet recommended that we should have dates and water. It is preferable. I am not going to give the details and the references of the hadith. All this is available in my larger series of Ramadan hadith with Dr. Zakir because I want to cut short my speech. So I am just going to say the points as soon as possible in brief. Tenth point is that when we break the fast, we should say the authentic dua. Many of us say unauthentic dua. And the most authentic dua is Zahaba Zamao. Inshallah. This dua is the most authentic. There are various dua which are from Zaif Hadith. We prefer that we say the authentic dua when we break the fast. Number 11, before we break the fast, we should pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and supplicate and do dua. Because one of the times when the dua more chance of it being accepted is when a fasting person makes a dua, especially before breaking the fast, a few minutes before breaking the fast. So you should take advantage of this and see to it that you do as much dua as possible. The twelfth point is that we should feed the poor people with the iftar. If you have learned Prophet said, if you feed the poor people and give them iftar, then you get the ajar as though you have fasted without the ajar being decreased from the person who has fasted. And now, because we are in a lockdown, it's not necessary that we have to go with them and eat with them when we are feeding them. You can always make provision. There are various NGOs who are asking for support, especially in the lockdown where poor people can't get their food. And now in the month of Ramadan, you get double ajar. Not only are you making them survive, you are also giving them iftar. Inshallah, grab this opportunity and see to it that you give a start to as many of the poor people as you can. The thirteen point is that we should offer tarawi. And as I mentioned, that normally we offer tarawi in the mosque and because of the lockdown, most of the mosques have been shut for the general public. So unfortunately, we cannot offer tarawi in the mosque. But surely, we can offer at home. And while offering tarawi, if you have a hafiz in your house, that's the best. Let him lead the tarawi. Though completing the Quran is not a fard in tarawi, but as much of the Quran you recite, the more sawab you get. So see to it to recite as much as the Quran. And whoever from your family knows the maximum portion of the Quran, let him be the imam, so that you can recite as much as possible in the tarawi. If there are possibilities that most of the people or all the people in the house do not know a large portion of the Quran, only know few of the surahs of the Juz Amma, then it, there is an option that any one of the family member, a male family member, adult, can lead the Quran, <laughs> lead the Tarawi by holding the Musaf of the Quran in the hand or holding a tablet or the mobile phone which has the Quran so that he can recite more of the Quran. Reciting from the memory if you're Hafiz is the best, but if you're not an Hafiz, if you're going to recite only Surah class or Surah Nas and the Tarawih will be so short, it is preferable you can hold the Quran and read from the Quran. Besides getting the Sawab of the Tarawih, you'll also get the Sawab of reading. It may not be more than the Sawab of Hafiz reading, but at least instead of reciting short Surahs, you can read the Quran, maybe recite one juice 
every day or half juice, whatever your capacity is, and make the best of it. The next is the recommended act during Ramadan. It is Salat al Duha. That is the 14th recommended act. And a beloved Prophet said you can read two rakat and as much as you can, Salat al Duha. The Salat al Duha mainly starts approximately 15 to 20 minutes after the Fajr, uh, after the sunrise, and ends just 15 to 20 minutes before the sun is at its peak, before the Duha time. The Prophet said you can read two rakat and as much as you want. The Prophet generally, mostly he read four rakat. So if you can read four rakat, two plus two salat al duha, that is preferable. Even two is accepted, but preferable is four rakat. And the time preferred by the Prophet is in the second half, so that you know closer to the sun at its peak, that is after after the midpoint of the sunrise and the sun at its peak. Because that time the hellfire is more hot, so that's a more preferable time. But you can start any time, 20 minutes after the sunrise, up to 15, 20 minutes before the sun at its peak. The 15th point, recommended point during the month of, uh, of Ramadan is that give as much as additional charity as possible besides the zakat, which is further. Zakat is the further. Besides that, give as much charity as possible. And, uh, and Allah SWT says in the Quran, Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 261, if someone sows one corn or one grain of corn in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will give you seven years, each bearing 100 crown. That means you get a sawab of 700 times, a profit of 70,000%. This is in normal times. In Ramadan, it's multiplied more. So make this best opportunity, do as much charity as you can in this blessed month of Ramadan. Read as many du'as of the Prophet for every act that you do. You enter the toilet, there is a du'a. You exit the toilet, there is a du'a. You wear a new clothes, there is a du'a. You look into the mirror, you do a du'a. As many du'as of the Prophet that is there in a lifetime, do as much as you possible, you will get more sawab in this month of Ramadan. Repent in this month of Ramadan as much as you can. Repenting, this Ramadan is also called as the month of repentance. If you repent, inshallah, Allah will accept your repentance if you repent sincerely and inshallah, Allah will forgive all your past sins. Do as much of zikr as possible of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this month of Ramadan. In the daytime, in the night time, it is the best opportunity. You read as much as the Quran as you can. As much as of the Quran you read. If you normally read maybe 10 minutes, this time read it 15 minutes, half an hour. If you are reading one page, read five page. If you are reading five page, read ten page. Increase in the recitation of the Quran. You will get a lot of ajar. Perform as many good deeds as you can in this month of Ramadan. And if someone irritates you or makes you angry, don't get angry. Say, I'm fasting, I'm fasting, I'm fasting. In this month of Ramadan, etikaf is advised, the sunnah, especially the last 10 days. But because of the lockdown, most of the massages are closed and we cannot do etikaf. But as I mentioned earlier, let's make the best opportunity isolate yourself complete in the full month of Ramadan. You, you most of us don't have to go to offices. There is no visitors visiting you. It's only your family. So do uh, more, get yourself more attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let this month of isolation during Ramadan get you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. See to it that you make it more beneficial than the other Ramadan. Seek for the Laylatul Qadr. Laylatul Qadr, as mentioned in the Quran, is equal to a thousand years, about more than 82 years of your life. And try and seek it in the last 10 nights. And if you get that, all your sins will be forgiven. It will be a great ajar for you. And this 
it's not a must that you should go in the mosque, you can do it at home. And during the last 10 nights, see to you to do more ibadah. And the next point is that do additional qiyamul layl. Besides the taraweeh that you do, and taraweeh, normally we pray immediately after, after the Isha. Now it's at home, you can pray at the much more preferred time, which is the last one third of the night. So taraweeh can be prayed last one third of the night, it's preferable. The longer it is, the better it is. And do qiyamul layl, do more of salah. If you're praying in normal time, then see to it, you pray additional in the last one third night. In the last 10 nights, because there are high chances that there will be light through Qadr, see to it you offer as much salah as possible, do extra salah, do the extra qiyamul layl. The 25th point is do tasqiyah nafs. Tasqiyah nafs means you do purification of your soul. See to it that you interrogate, you introspect yourself and see to it that you improve all your faults and do as much as good deeds as possible. The 26th recommended act that can be done is do as much as sunnah of the beloved prophet. For example, when you wear your slippers, you wear with the right hand. When you are eating dates, see to it you eat in the odd numbers, one, three, five, do as much as sunnah as possible throughout the day. Avoid as much as makhuru as possible. All is possible. For example, to stand and drink water is makhuru. When you are drinking water, sit and drink water. Read as much of authentic hadith of the beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The more hadith you can read, say Bukhari, say Muslim, you can read the other books of Qutb al-Sitta, you can read Riyadh al-Salihin and as much as possible of the seerah of the Prophet. See to it that you pay attention on the Sunnah, especially the Miswak, because the Prophet did Miswak. Even during Ramadan, some people have a misconception that you can't use Miswak. You can and it is recommended to use, use the Miswak. If it is recommended by the Prophet that if you do Umrah during Hajj, uh, during Ramadan, you get the sawab of Hajj. Now it's unfortunate that all of us cannot do this Umrah because the Masjid al Haram in Makkah it is closed because of the lockdown. Inshallah, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we may get more opportunity in the future. When you meet people, you forgive them. Not that you have to meet them personally because of the lockdown, whether on the phone, social meeting. You forgive as many people as you can, as you can in the month of Ramadan because if you forgive the human beings, Allah will inshallah forgive you. Do as much as Islam that you can do, whether using the social media, on WhatsApp, on Facebook. Utilize these time, do Islam with your friends. You can even do Dawah. To your, to your friends, this is the 33rd uh, uh, recommended act in the month of Ramadan. Do dawah to your non-Muslim friends, invite them towards Islam. There are more chances that the heart will open towards Islam in the month of Ramadan. Since the gate of heaven is open, the gates of hell are closed. Uh, and the shaitan, the devils, they are chained. Besides reading the first salah, and the Sunnah the Muqidda, even read the Sunnah Gair Muqidda, especially in the month of Ramadan. And there are 10 Sunnah Gair Muqidda, that is 2 Rakat Sunnah Gair Muqidda after the Duhar Salah, 2 plus 2, 4 Rakat before the Asar Far Salah, 2 Rakat before the Maghrib Far Salah, and 2 Rakat before the Isha Far Salah. So basically, the 10 Rakat of uh, so totally there are 17 plus 3, 20 plus 12 Sunnat al-Muqadda, that's 32 and then 10 of the Gera Muqadda, that is 42. If you add the Vitar, it becomes, if you add the Tarawi, it becomes an additional 8, that becomes 50. If you add the Salat al-Dua, it becomes additional 4, that becomes 54. So see to it that you at least read 54 minimum 
raka in a day and you can keep on adding the sunnah after doing wudu and various other but these try and do it this it will be it will be beneficial for you this is the uh, 34th recommended act the 35th recommended act in the month of ramadan is that do more and more increase in your dua and your supplication after the salah do more dua in the month of ramadan inshallah Allah will accept it the next is that you attend islamic lectures physically if you cannot there are live sessions and now because of social media there are so many conferences and lectures you can attend live like the what you're doing today you're watching me live i'm in malaysia and people from all over the world maybe more than 200 countries in the world they are seeing on the peace tv network they're seeing on the social media the facebook and millions are watching take the opportunity live programs next you can even see recorded programs you can see lectures islamic lectures on the youtube on the other social media the video recordings and try and get as much knowledge as possible in this month of ramadan you have to be give more time to your family in the month of Ramadan, if you have more time, and now because you are locked on at home, see to it that you spend more time with your family, get the ajar, come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A beloved Prophet said, the best amongst you is he who is the best to the family, to the wife, to the children, etc. So see to it that you make the most of it. Read as much as of the seerah of the Prophet. And the best book I can recommend is of uh, Mubarak Safir Rahman Puri, Mubarak Puri, Safir Rahman Mubarak Puri, The Seal Nectar, Rekal Maktoum. See to it in this month of Ramadan, you, you meet others and you help them as much as you can. In this month of Ramadan, the 41st point, be more cheerful and happy. And the last 42nd point I would like to mention besides various other points is that see to it that you spread love and affection and care to the other people around you. This was just in brief about the 42 recommended things that you can do in the month of Ramadan and take the opportunity of this isolation, being at home and you come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm sorry today also I spoke for about half an hour, thought I would speak for 20 minutes, but I did speak less than last time so that we can have more time for, for the question of succession. I would like to remind you that you can mention your questions, preferably on the WhatsApp as a text message to with writing your name as well as the city and the country of your residence. You can text this message to the WhatsApp number plus six zero double one two six nine five three eight nine five. I repeat plus six zero double one two six nine five three. 895. We will try and pick up what the, the team is trying to select questions. We have some questions which were pending, we will be taking. Also the new questions that are coming, even on the Facebook as well as. And just to tell you that in the last time I came live, on the Facebook alone, 911,000 people watched it. More than 911,000 people, mashallah, it reached. Alhamdulillah. Sorry, watched. It reached about 2. Point, more than 2.8 million people. It reached only on the Facebook. Out of which, more than 911,000 people watched it. And 206,000 people, more than that, gave comments. And there were more than 20,000 questions. Inshallah, you can find your question. You can, you can even write on your Facebook, on, on the YouTube, on the Instagram. But the chances are more, they'll be selected from the WhatsApp. And where's the mobile? There are various messages. I can't see. You mean messages scrolling by with life? There is a lot of things. Many people are saying salams. I would like to say walaikum salam to all of you. There are there are people love you and, and I love you too. There is Mateen Rana. He's saying I'm from Mirat and assalamu alaikum to too. There is An Anichur Rahman. Thanks. And thanks to you too. From Afghanistan, you have Sahal Khan. He's saying, may Allah bless you, may Allah bless you too. 
We have some people saying we love you, welcome, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala love you too. May Allah bless you and your family from Muhammad Musarraf and so on. We will just go on to the questions. Some have been selected and my team is sending me questions after they're selecting it. The first question is from a non-Muslim. He's saying, peace be upon you. My name is Abraham from New Delhi. The question is, when people revert back to Islam, like Cassius Clay, Sonny Bill Williams, and Mike Tyson, and many more. So Muslims say that God gave them guidance, Hidayah. So that's why they reverted. I wanted to know why he, God, didn't give guidance to everyone. Why he gave guidance to some people and not to all. And this is a very important question by our brother Ibrahim. Uh, Allah says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Yunus, chapter number 10, verse number 99, that if he wanted, he could have made all the human beings in this world as believers. So for Allah, to make 100% of the human beings. Now there are more than 7.75 billion human beings. For Allah to make all the human beings as believers, as Muslim, is very easy. Kun kun. But the question is that we human beings are one of the best creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, Allah al It is He who has created death and life to test which of you is good indeed. So this life is a test for the hereafter. So when you are coming in, coming for a test, for an examination, the supervisor cannot help you and even if you do something wrong, can pass you. I mean, supervisor can, can, can see to it that you, don't, that you don't break the rules. The teacher can give you grace marks, but cannot pass you if you have failed and did not write anything or broke all the rules. So in the same fashion, Regarding the question, if Allah wanted, He could have made all the human beings the Muslim. But then, what is the difference? All the other human, all the other creations of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, except the jinn and the human beings, they obey Him. So, what difference is in this creation of human being? Regarding, why does He select few people? There are some criteria for Allah to select who He guides. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Kabut, chapter number twenty-nine, verse number sixty-nine, that if you strive in the pathway of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will open up your pathways. That means anyone, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, if he strives, if he struggles in the path of Almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will open up the pathways. All these people, whether it be Cassius Clay, whether it be Mike Tyson, whether it, whether it be Cash Steven, if you read the history, when, when they were non-Muslim, they strive. They, like you, if you hear the story, the background of Cat Steven was a pop singer, now he's called Yusuf Islam. When his life was in danger, he said that if, if you save my life, oh my God, I will dedicate my life towards you. And then someone gave him the copy of the Quran, he read the Quran and he came close to Islam. So if you strive, irrespective whether you're a Christian or a Hindu or a non-Muslim, if you sincerely strive to come too close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will come close to Almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the only criteria required for you is striving and struggling that I want to find the true Almighty God and follow His commandments. Inshallah, Allah will get you closer, whether you will read the Quran and come close to Allah, whether you will hear the lecture of Adai and come close to Allah, you may attend the event, you may hear the Adhan. The main criteria is you strive to come closer to Almighty God and Inshallah, Allah will give you Hidayah. Hope that answers the question. Uh, uh, there's a question by by Muhammad Rehan. It's a question that just came on the WhatsApp from West Bengal, India. I gave dawah to my non-Muslim friend. And she accepted Islam on the first of Ramadan, but but she's married and has a little child. Now she can't tell her family that she is 
uh, can't tell her family that she has accepted Islam. So my question is, is it okay if she worships idols till she can't tell her family about Islam? One more question, is it okay if a man gives dawah to a woman? Thank you. As far as the question, is it okay that she can worship idols till the time she informs the family? Idol worship is the biggest sin in Islam. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 48 and Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 116, if Allah pleases, he may forgive any sin, but the sin of shirk he will never forgive. So idol worship is the biggest sin. After doing shirk, if you ask for forgiveness, inshallah Allah will forgive that also. Now that she, has, that she has accepted Islam, she should not do idol worship. And it's not a must. In the Hindu family, they don't do idol worship every day. If a family even is very pious and doing the rituals, surely you can make an excuse and avoid doing it. If you feel telling your family is a little bit risky now, you can delay in telling maybe after a few days, after a few weeks, no problem. But see to it that you stay away from the sins, especially the major sin of idol worship. Can a man give dawah to a woman? Yes, as long as he doesn't break the rules of the hijab. Like I am coming now on the Peace TV, on the Facebook, on the social media, and there are hundreds and thousands of Ladies also watching, no problem. But if many people say that they want to do one-to-one -one dawa with a non, with a man doing to a woman, to a non meram that is not recommended, and especially in a closed room. As the Prophet said, if a man and a woman, the opposite sex, are in a closed room and there is no third person, the third person is the devil. So you have to maintain the hijab. You cannot do one-to-one -one dawa. You cannot laugh and joke with a non meram You can talk, but with lowering your gaze. Saying that there's not too much there's not too much complacent in your voice. So maintaining the hijab, you can do best is through books or through social media. Hope that answers the question. There are many people, Kifayat, Kifayatullah saying, please, thanks to you. There is Khidr Azijat, why don't you come to Pakistan? Inshallah, whenever Allah wills, I will come. There is an... Uh, the next question is that I am Abdullah from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. My question is that if a Muslim dies in a plague, will he be called a martyr or will he just get the sawab of a martyr? There are various hadiths talking about this incident of a person dying in the plague. Abla Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in Hadith of Tirmidhi, volume number 2, Hadith number 1063, the, that the Prophet said, there are five types of martyrs in Islam. The one, who is killed in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a person who dies in the plague, a person who dies of stomach illness, a person who dies while drowning, and a person who dies in a crush or a collapse, maybe a house has collapsed. So these five categories of the people, according to the Prophet, they are martyrs. So if a person dies in plague, yes, he is called as a martyr. There is a hadith in Ibn Majah, volume number 4, hadith number 2804. The Prophet asks one of the sahabas that, what do you know about the martyrs amongst you? So he said that those who are killed in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are martyrs. Then the Prophet replied, if this was the only case, then martyrs in my ummah would be very few. Then he said, martyrs are those who are killed in the way of Allah. Martyrs are those who die in the cause of Allah. Martyrs are those who die because of stomach illness. Martyrs are those who die in a plague. And there's another addition by another narrator saying that martyrs are those who even, who even die while drowning. So these are five categories of people who the Prophet said are martyrs. Regarding the question, if a person dies in a plague, will he get is he called a martyr or will he get a sawab of a martyr? There is another hadith of the Prophet Muhammad which is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 7, hadith number 5734, 
where the beloved Prophet Muhammad said, Hazrat Aisha may Allah be with her said, that the Prophet said that Allah sends plagues as a punishment to the unbelievers to whomever he wants. And as for the believers, it is a blessing. And if a believer during plague lives patiently and believing that nothing will befall him except what Allah has ordained for him, Allah says he will get a reward of a matter. In this hadith, a person who lives patiently is the criteria and believes that nothing will befall him, nothing will happen to him except what is ordained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gets the sawab of a martyr. And according to Ibn Hajar, he says, Rahimullah, that there are three categories of people in this. A person who dies in plague, he gets the sawab of plague. A person who is affected by plague but does not die, he too gets the sawab of a martyr. And a person who during plague is patient and has faith that nothing will befall him and he does not get sick, he does not die, yet he gets the sawab of a martyr. But a person who dies in plague, besides being called a martyr, he also gets a sawab of a martyr, he gets both ajar. Hope that answers the question. Next question. Is it allowed to kiss one's wife while fasting and does kissing have one any effect on one's fast? Can a husband kiss his wife during fasting? There is hadith in Sunnah Tirmidhi, void number 3, hadith number uh, 1297. Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her. She said that the Prophet, peace be upon him, he kissed and embraced his wives during fasting many times and he had more control over his desires than any one of you. That means kissing and embracing your wife during fasting is accepted, is permitted as long as you can control your desire. There is another hadith when a person comes and asks the Prophet, can I kiss my wife during fasting? The Prophet says yes. Another person comes and asks the Prophet, can I kiss my wife while fasting? He says no. So the sahabas asked me, the first person you said yes, the second you said no, why? So he said, I knew the first person could control his desires after kissing, the second person could not, therefore I said yes to the first person and no to the second person. That means you are allowed to kiss your wife and embrace your wife during fasting as long as you can control your desires and do not go ahead and do anything which will break the fast. You do not commit any act which are fast breakers. If you have control, you can you can kiss your wife and even embrace her. Uh, there is another question asked by one of the persons on the WhatsApp. It's Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Dr. Zakir Uncle. My name is Sabiya Tabassum from Dhaka, Bangladesh. Question How to become Allah's favorite Muslim? How can I become Dr. Zakir Naik? I am a big fan of yours. Please pray for me so that I can become Dr. Zakir Naik and enter Janatul Firdaus. We Bangladeshi people love you and we respect you. There is a similar question asked, so I have asked my team to club the questions which are similar so that more people are happy that I have asked the questions, that I have answered the question. A similar question is asked by Abdul. Ghaffar, Ab Abdul Ghafoor Khan from Pakistan. Sir, I am from Pakistan and I am a great admirer of you. My profession is nursing and my question is how can I become like you? There is a third question similar to that. Assalamu alaikum, sir, I am Rahul Mia from India. I want to be a Dai, sir. Please tell me what should I do? I want to become like you and Sheikh Ahmad Dida. Regarding the basic question, all the three people have asked that, that all of them want to become a die like me. They want to enter Jalal Tarifri Dos. Let me tell you at the outset that it's not compulsory to become like me to enter Jalal Tarifri Dos. As far as I'm concerned, 
I, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he accept my efforts whatever he can. And I consider there are millions of people who are better than me in terms of knowledge, in terms of dawa. It is hadha bin fazhi rabbi. It is only because of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is only because of the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that whatever little bit I have achieved is because of him. The basic, I, and when I think of myself that there are, you know, hundreds of thousands of people who are more knowledgeable than me, how come people come for my talks? How come people listen to me on the Facebook, on the YouTube? I wonder. And then that reminds me, you know, that it is three criteria which I always say is important. Number one is that Allah says in the Quran, Surah Imran, chapter 3, verse 160, that if Allah helps you, none can overcome you. If Allah forsakes you, who is there then who can help you? So let the believers put their trust in Allah. Number one is having faith and trust in Allah. Number two, Allah says in Surah Al-Kabut, chapter number 29, verse number 69, if you strive in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will open up your pathways. Second is striving, struggling, hard work. Number three, Allah says in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 43, and Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 7, First, alu hal zikri in kuntum la talamun. If you don't know, ask the person who's an expert. The third is the technique. So number one is Allah's help. Second is striving and struggling and hard work. Number three is technique. As far as getting Allah's help, the more you have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more you worship Him, the more you believe in Him, the more you have trust in Him, Inshallah, he will help you. Imagine, I couldn't have dreamt in my wildest dream of speaking in front of 25 people. I could have dreamt of becoming the best surgeon in the world, the best doctor in the world. But in my wildest dream, I could not have dreamt of speaking in front of 25 people. Because, as many of you know, that I was a stammerer since childhood. When people used to ask me, what is my name? I said, my name is Zaza Zaza Zakir. So imagine what I cannot dream when I started doing dawa, when I went on the stage, I realized that I did not stammer. Most of the people when they go in front of public, they get cold feet. For me it was opposite. When I speak one to one, I used to stammer, but in public, my stammering vanished. Then later on, when I used to speak one to one to non-Muslims, even that time I did not stammer. With Muslims, I used to stammer. And slowly, slowly, Alhamdulillah, my stammering kept on reducing. And yet I stammer off the stage. Allah helps me, Alhamdulillah. So, and I'm sure most of the millions of people who are watching today, most of you may have been multiple times better than what I was when I started my dawah. So when Allah can make such a person who is a stammerer, give lectures where large numbers are attending, so why can't you do that? I don't think so I've really done any great deed. Neither have I sacrificed something. People tell me, oh, I'm a fool that I left my medical profession. Some people come and say, oh, because you sacrificed your medical profession. There is no sacrifice. Giving up my medical profession, as compared to what Allah has given me in the field of dawa, everything, people watching, the fame, which, I, which was not the reason why we did it, the recognition, the heads of state meeting, me leaving the medical profession is not even the drop in the ocean, and Allah gave me the ocean. So the basic thing we realize is that we should sacrifice the things that you love for the sake of Allah. If you sacrifice for the sake of Allah, if you take one step in the way of Allah, Allah will take multiple times more close to you. So number one is sacrifice, love Allah, trust Allah, have faith in Him, and then ask an expert. As far as we have dawah training programs, where we had in the past, where we train people, but number one is help of Allah, number two is striving and struggling, and last is the training. Training is not a must, I did not get training, it was Allah who helped me, that's the least important. And to go to Jannah of Firdos, follow the glorious Quran, and follow the Sahih Hadith, as much as the implement of the glorious Quran, as much as the implement of the Sahih Hadith and the commandments of the Prophet and Allah, there are more chances that you will enter Jannah, inshallah Jannah of Firdos.
there are many messages from Zubair Khan, from Muhammad Shafiq, from Imran Rashid, from Ashraf Hussein, from Ilyas, from Sultan Ponia, and my salams to all of you. It's difficult to answer all the questions. I already received thousands. Another question which is related. The respected Dr. Zakir Naik. Sir, I am Muzahar Hussain, city of Rampurhat, West Bengal, India. Do you have any trick for memorizing from different verses of the Quran or books? of the same thing. A similar question asked by Brother Fahim from Kashmir, from Pakistan. Do you have a photographic memory? What is the reason behind your phenomenal memory? And again, the answer is the same what I gave earlier, that first is Allah's help, second is struggling and striving, and third is technique. There are various techniques for memory which you get when you do MBA courses, which is called as mapping and all the others. And believe me, all these techniques have good limitations. The best is the help of Allah. Certain things are there that when you memorize something after about 20 minutes, again rehearse it, again rehearse it after two hours, again after a few hours. The more you rehearse it and revise it, the more chance it will be part of you. Then next day, the more you use it, the more it becomes part of your memory. And once it goes into your permanent memory, then even if you don't revise, it will be in your memory. For example, Surah Fatiha. Almost all the Muslims, all the Muslims know Surah Fatiha. Even you get up from your sleep and they ask you to recite, you can recite. Because that has gone in the permanent memory. So the more you revise, the more you practice, it becomes part of your memory. I don't consider myself that I've got photogenic memory. So what I do is I strive. I have to keep on revising. I know that if this lecture has about 100, 150 quotations from Quran and Hadith, if I don't revise, maybe I may say 90%. If I revise, I may be able to say 99%. So before every lecture, I try and revise as much as possible so that it is closer to the accuracy. So more you strive, the more you struggle, the more you have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah you'll be more successful. The next question is I am Abdul Rahman from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. A prophet, peace be upon him, said, There is no adwa, contagious disease. Is this not contradicting with the medical science? Yes, there is a hadith of a beloved Prophet. It is in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 7. Hadith number 5707, where the beloved Prophet said, there is no adwa. Adwa means contagious disease. What you have to understand, that you have to read, and it says that there are no bad omens, etc. And it, and it continues the hadith. But if you read the shara and the commentary of this hadith, it says that here what the Prophet meant was, when there is no adwa, there is no contagious disease, which can be conveyed without the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It means that no one can acquire any contagious disease unless it is permitted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not just a blanket statement that there is no contagious diseases. Otherwise, as you mentioned correctly, it would be against medical science. There are. And if you read the complete hadith, the hadith says there is no adwa, there is no contagious diseases, meaning there is no contagious disease. It is not conveyed unless with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there is no bad omens, etc. And it says that if you see a leper, run away from it as though you have seen a lion. This indicates that leprosy is a contagious disease and the Prophet is advising you when you see a person having contagious disease, you run away, indicating there is contagious disease. So if you read the complete hadith, you understand that the context is that you cannot get any contagious disease or any disease unless with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the other hadiths I quoted that we have to take precaution during contagious diseases. So that means of course there is contagious disease but have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that nothing will befall you unless except with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So according to the hadith 
There are contagious diseases according to the Quran. There are contagious diseases. Quran says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent plagues on the Bani Israel. And Surah Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 59. So there are contagious diseases. Allah, and the, Allah says and the Prophet said what precautions you should take. But it's giving an indication that have faith in Allah. It will not harm you except with the permission of Allah. Hope that answers the question. There are several other questions coming. There's a question by Zubaid Ahmad from Hyderabad, India. How can one love Allah and Muhammad sallallahu peace be upon him, more than himself to become a true Muslim. Shall we do deeds out of love or fear of Allah? How can we love Allah and his messenger more than we love ourselves? And, and the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu that a Muslim is not a true Muslim until he loves Allah and his messenger more than himself. So one of the criteria for you to be a complete good Muslim is that you love Allah and his Rasul more than you love love yourself and uh, should you follow the deeds of the prophet and allah because you love them or because you fear them it should be both see the fear that you fear of allah is unlike the fear that you have of other things the love that you have for allah is unlike the love that you have for the love for allah is ultimate love and the fear of allah is that you don't want to displease allah you don't want to displease the beloved prophet it's a different sort of fear it's a different sort of love altogether. And how can you love Allah more than yourself? It's when you realize that when you do this thing, it's going to cause loss to you. Yet you do it for the sake of Allah. Sake of Allah that is the time you love Allah more than yourself. And you know very well that now you have got a very good offer for a job in a bank. And you got a very lucrative salary. Maybe the salary what you earn in the bank is offering you triple the salary. But you know that a beloved prophet said that riba, interest, conventional interest bank is haram. So you reject that. Why? For the sake of Allah. Now you are loving Allah more than yourself. If you do the job, you will get triple the salary. You will have all the luxury. You will have more luxury of the world. Now this is an example of how you are loving Allah more than yourself. For example, the prophet said that don't leave the place in which when you are living in a place and if, it's, if a plague breaks out, don't leave it. So you have to obey Allah and his messenger. You, you cannot run away. You have to have faith. Be patient. Whatever will befall you, even if I have to die, I'll die. If you die, I'll become a martyr. So here you are following the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not only proven by medical science, but you are doing for sake of Allah. You are loving Allah more than yourself. So always when you put, your, you, you put Allah and his messenger more than yourself, that means you're loving Allah more than yourself. And if you love Allah more than yourself, then you are a true believer, a true moment, and inshallah, Guru Janati Fidus. There is a question from Abdul Fahim. Assalamu alaikum Zakir bhai. I am Jawad from USA, a student. I wanted to, maybe Abdul Fahim, maybe the other name is coming out of this. This is a question from the YouTube. So his real name may be Jawad. He says Assalamu alaikum Zakir sahib. I am Jawad from USA, a student. I wanted to know if online Taravi are allowed or not. As long as online Taravi, whether your you know, Taravi is going on in Makkah Haram and you are in Bangladesh or USA or Malaysia or India, can you read Taravi following the online Taravi? And it is a unanimous decision, unanimous fatwa from all the fuqahas that for a salah, for you to be part of the jama, you should be close to the jama. There are different opinions in different fuqaha. The Maliki school of thought say that even if there is a road, or even if there is a river in between you, yet, yet you are part of the jama. 
according to Hanafi school of thought, it is about two rows. If it's more than distance, more than two rows, then you can't be part of Jamaat. According to Hamli, as long as you hear, as long as you see, the never is. But all of them agree that you should be close. You cannot be far away. So unanimously, all the fuqahs agree that you cannot do tarawi online from another city, another time zone. Even same zone, if you are very far away, the distance is miles together. You cannot do. But the question asked, the question someone asked, that in this situation where there is lockdown and almost all the mosques are closed, now can we read Tarawi online or by listening on the television, whether it be from the Haram or whether any other place? Okay. As far as this is concerned, most of the fiqh council that I have tried to find the answer in the last few days, I did not find any fiqh council saying that you know you can read online but there is a fatwa by Sheikh Muhammad Hassan Dadu and according to me I mean he is one of the best living Islamic scholars today Alhamdulillah Sheikh Muhammad Hassan Dadu he is from Mauritania and he is one of a great scholar he is a muhaddis mashallah one of the most knowledgeable one of the most knowledgeable living Islamic scholars in the world and, and I respect him and I've met him several times and I'm very close to him Alhamdulillah according to him he is fatwa is the same generally you cannot do online but in this situation because most of the mosques are closed and most of the people don't have who are huffas in the house he has given the fatwa only on this situation not otherwise because the mosques are closed you can follow the Imam online, whether on the television, and your Salah will be accepted. The other Fuqahas, the other scholars are saying, and the other Fiqh councils are saying, because Tarawih is not a Fard, we don't want to open the door yet. Because not a Fard, it is a Sunnah the Mokhida, very important Sunnah, so let's not open the door. But according to Sheikh Muhammad Hassan Dadu, that you can do, if it's going to get you more Khushu and more concentration in your salah, this is the answer that's available. The next question by Ibrahim from Ghana. Assalamu alaikum. Dr. Zakir, if a person acquires wealth by cheating and later realizes his mistake and decides to stop cheating and decides to stop cheating, what will he do with the acquired wealth? But natural, if a person wants to repent, if he is doing any evil, there are criteria for, for repentance and there are basically four criteria for repentance or rather five. Number one is agree it is wrong. So if he is cheating, agree cheating is wrong. Number two, stop it immediately. Number three, don't do it again. Number four, ask for forgiveness and repent. And number five, undo it if you can. So for repentance to be accepted, besides agreeing it is wrong, besides stopping it immediately, besides asking for forgiveness, besides not doing it again, the last criteria is undo if you can. So if you have acquired wealth by cheating, if you have cheated an individual person in business, see to it, you give that wealth back to him. If you have cheated generally and you don't know who the person is, then see to it you give that money in charity to the poor people. If acquired wealth is by cheating or if you have robbed, see to it the person you have robbed from, give that object back or give that wealth back. That will get you the best ajar and Allah will accept your repentance inshallah. There are many questions. I'm just trying to select the better questions. And the next question is from 
Danny Nobri. He's from Cairo, Egypt. I want to ask you about stock market. What does the Sharia say about trading in stocks? As we know, if we invest in long term, it's halal. How about trading for a short time, for one hour, for a day, for a week? I make sure that it's not gambling because I do analysis before buying and sell it after getting capital gain. Thank you, Dr. Zakir. As far as can you invest in halal stock and can you do it for a short term, for a day or for a week or for a few hours? As far as if you want to invest in stock, first you have to identify whether the stock that you're investing is halal. There are various criteria of how to analyze whether the stock that you're purchasing the shares of your purchasing of a company is halal or not. Number one, the major, the, the activity of the company should not be haram. It should not be dealing in alcohol. It should not be dealing in pork. So the number one is it should, it should not be a bank which is based on riba, the conventional bank. The activity, basic activity should not be haram. Number two, there are various other criteria that the company should not take so much loan that the debt to the cash ratio is very high. So there are fukahas and scholars who have devised that the activity should not be haram and even the debt taken should be a minute percentage. The various criteria. So you have got indexes. For example, you have the Dow Jones Index of Islamic Stocks. So these people are experts and they lay the criteria why these stocks are halal, why these stocks are not halal, it's haram. So if it is identified as a halal stock by an expert uh, fukaha, in this field or an Islamic organization which is specialized, you can invest in that. In stock, it's permissible. The second part of the question, can you invest for a short time? For a few hours, for a day, for a week, and I'm expert, I'm not I'm not gambling because I'm I'm doing I'm doing a calculation. See, when you buy shares, is actually you are becoming a shareholder. I'm asking a simple question with all the calculation. Will you physically be a partner, not shares, physically be a partner of a business only for one hour? And the answer is no. Will you, with all your calculation, will you say, okay, I want to be a partner for one hour? No, you cannot. <laughs> physically, if you say that I want to share and become a partner for a day, would you become of a company? No, you cannot. So stock exchange gives us easy flexibility to buy shares, but that does not mean you should gamble. If it's done for a short period, intentionally that I will sell it when it goes off give, and you keep it for a few hours or, a, for, or a, for a day or a few days, it tend to point to gambling. If it's done unintentionally that you want to keep it for a few years and then you realize something market has crashed and then you want to sell it, that's acceptable. But from first you plan that you're going to sell it as soon as it increases even if it's a few hours and all, this is speculation and this is not permitted in Islam. So you can involve in stock if it's a halal stock, halal share, but don't Speculate, don't do it for few hours, keep it for a long term. Uh, the next question from, from Mary from USA. She's a revert. And she mentioned that, Salam, I took Shahada in April 2019, that's about one year back, and still confused about praying. I have two autoimmune diseases which make my leg dead and crippled, so I can't do prayer properly. I also have to take medicines during daytime due to spasms in my face. So I try to only take one medicine that stops the spasms with little water in midday and keep the rest for when the sun goes down. Other Muslims tell me I can't fast because I'm sick. Others say I broke the fast in between by taking that pill. By the way, I see I'm refraining from all types of food except a tiny bit of water for one pill. And when it comes to prayers, I have no idea to pray other than how Christians pray. And I have been ridiculed by many Muslims telling me I will never be a Muslim because I can't do these things. 
it makes me feel as if I'm letting down my Allah. And it makes me depressed because I don't know what else to do. I feel Allah will never accept me because of this. I never taught how to do prayers. I was never taught how to do prayers. I tried to learn it from the YouTube, which is sad because the people who did Shahada with me just left me on my own. When I do ablution, it is mandatory that I wash my feet. I have tape on my right foot because it's dead with no feeling. The tape keeps it in the right direction. When I walk, it will drag. I have to wear compression socks or blood will rush to my feet. But everything else I can do with no problem. I would like to say assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam to Sister Mary. And I would like to, I'd like to welcome you to the fold of Islam. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive all your sins. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala get you closer to Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you Jannah of Fidos. There are basically three questions that you asked. One is regarding offering salah. The second is regarding wudu, and the third is regarding fasting. As far as the first question is concerned that you don't know how to do proper salah, inshallah I will ask one of my colleagues to send you a book on salah. It is, the, it is called The Prophet's Prayer by Sheikh Nasruddin Albani. It, is, it describes the prayer in detail. And the point to be noted, sister, that because you're sick, it is not required that you pray exactly how you should pray if there are difficulties. You mentioned in your question there are so many difficulties. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 102, that those who are sick or those who are traveling, you know, they can shorten the I mean they shorten the prayer. And those who cannot, those who are sick and those who cannot pray while standing, they can pray while sitting. If you cannot pray while sitting, you can pray while lying. If you cannot pray while lying, only with indication to your sister, Salah is never excused for any man, for a woman, unless she is having a menstrual cycle or postpartum, these few things. It is compulsory for a man if he is an adult Muslim and if he is conscious, Salah is not excused at all unless he is unconscious. If he can't pray standing, he should pray while sitting. If he can't pray sitting, he should pray while lying. You cannot pray lying, at least by indication. So sister, whatever difficulty you have, you may be aware of certain things, but you cannot do them. It is excused. Imagine, you can sit while praying. And there was a time when I myself had problems in the knee, and I showed to the best of doctors, and for two years, I used to sit on the chair and pray. So if you have a medical problem, if you cannot follow the exact requirement as described by the Prophet, it is perfectly all right, you will get the same thing. Even if you pray while sitting, if you, even if you pray while lying, even if you pray by indication, if you are paralyzed and only your eyes are moving, you can pray with your eyes. There are some people who only fingers are used, they can pray with the finger. So praying is not excused at all until certain, except in certain conditions of women in menstruation, postpartum, etc. But for the men, as long as they are conscious and they are adult, they have to pray. Inshallah, I will send a book to you which will describe in detail. And inshallah, even if you cannot do, do those things because of a medical problem, don't worry about it. Don't do it. You can sit and pray. You can lie and pray. Come to the second part of the question that you have got plaster on your feet and you have got some um, which you cannot do wudu, cannot take it out. In this case, is where if you are wearing a plaster because your feet is fractured or if a medical problem and you cannot take them out, you can do masa over it. You can just rub your wet hands while doing wudu. Other parts you do wudu as you normally do on your leg which has a plaster, that part which has a plaster, just rub with your hand, the wet hand and that will suffice. You don't have to remove the plaster, your wudu would be complete inshallah. And the last part of the question that you have to take some medicines, you have to take medical and if not twice at least once a day, so can you fast and if you take little water and little medicine, will your fast be accepted? Sister, in certain situations where you cannot fast because of your illness, if the doctor says, okay, you can take the medicine early in the morning before you start the fast and just immediately after you break the fast and you can survive, mashallah, you can keep the fast. But the doctor says, no, you have to take it during daytime, maybe at midday. There's no adoption, otherwise it's detrimental to your health. Then you are excused from fasting. If you have a disease which is temporary, then you are excused for that time and the moment you get well, you can compensate for the fast which you missed. But if you have a disease which is permanent, 
and it will never be solved. Then what you have to do, if so, and you cannot fast later on, then what you do, you feed a person, a poor person, for every fast you miss. So if you miss the full month, the 29 days, 30 days, that many poor people you feed so that you get the ajar and believe me sister, you will get the full ajar of fasting. You don't have to go into trouble. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want to put difficulties into you. So if you cannot fast because of medical problem, Allah has given you a concession. Just feed a poor man for every fast you missed and inshallah you will get the ajar of fasting. Inshallah your WhatsApp number has come onto the mobile. I will ask my wife inshallah to inshallah call you later on and so that she can help you and help you in other aspects of Islam. And whenever you are free, you are most welcome to call my wife. She will be texting you soon. Soon She will speak to you inshallah, if not today, tomorrow, inshallah. And see to it that on one to one basis, if you have any queries on Islam, she will answer them. And mashallah, my wife is also, mashallah, very good in giving lectures because she doesn't give generally in public. Therefore, less people have heard her. But mashallah, inshallah, she will help you to fulfill and follow as much of Islam as possible, sister. Jazakallah shukran. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may He put you in Jannah Firdos, that even in this condition you accepted Islam and I'm close, inshallah. This will, inshallah, benefit you in this world as well as in the Akhirah. We have a few more minutes, and as time permits, inshallah, we will try and take a couple of more questions. There is a question asked. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. My name is Zahid. I am from Chittagong, Bangladesh. Will Peace TV Network launch an online dawa course where Muslims will be trained to give dawa to non-Muslims? A similar question is, passed, is, is asked by one or two other people. A second similar question to the earlier one is Assalamu alaikum, doctor. Your website has very interesting. Your website is very interesting. Is very interesting. In that website, you said about international dawa training program. Is it after Ramadan? Is it available online? The third question, which is similar. My name is Isa Qazi. I'm from Mumbai, India. So, mashallah, similar question is being asked from someone from Mumbai, India, from some Chittagong, Bangladesh, and other parts of the world. I wanted to know about the dawa training program. How can I attend it? All three asking about dawa training program. As far as I am concerned, personally, I have taken very few dawa training programs. I have taken a couple of dawa training programs for the local people, that the Indians, and I have taken two international dawa training programs in my full life. That's a complete course. One was in 1999, which was uh, for approximately approximately 40 days. The working days uh, were about 20, 324. And the second one we had after several years, that is in 2016, again in Bombay. In both these our training programs, we selected 20 people, 20 people from different parts of the world. We received hundreds and more than 1,000 applications. We selected and we had a training program in 2016, January and February for about 50 days. The working days were about 33. And we have recorded this, this our training program. Personally, for me to conduct dawah training program is too time consuming. That is the reason the last dawah training program we recorded it. And inshallah, if time permits, we'll edit it and have it on the satellite channel and other media also. As the question asked, that we have just launched our website. The address is zakirnaik.com. I repeat, our earlier website was it was closed down because they're associated with an organization and the allegation laid by the government. At that time, the Islamic Research Foundation was the fourth largest visited Islamic website in the world. We just launched on the first of Ramadan a new website by the name zakirnaik.com. And one section in this website is International Dawah Training Program. And when you click, it says, coming soon, inshallah. Because Dawah Training Program itself is another website, individually different by itself. We have yet certain portions to be completed in the main website. That is the reason some part says will be coming soon. After we complete 
the other parts of the website, we will inshallah build our international Dawah training program. This international Dawah training program on the website rakirnaik.com is an online program, has most of the notes. It will not be as effective as attending it directly. If you attend live, it's a different ball game altogether, a different impact altogether. If you hear it or watch it on a video, it may have about maybe 20% impact. If you do it online, it may have 10% impact, but something is better than nothing. All the notes, inshallah, will be uploaded on this website. Dawa, how it's to be done to atheists, to the Christians, to the Hindus, to the Parsis, the impact of Dawa, various aspects of public speaking, and various, it's there. We expect that this would take another one or two months. Inshallah, in the month of Ramadan, we will complete the other portions which are pending because this website is voluminous. It is huge. It has a lot of information and almost all my lectures will be uploaded on Inshallah. Now a few are there. There are lecture scripts, there are books of mine, my interactions, my meetings and all the other facilities are there. It is going to be voluminous and same time it will also have uh, another exclusive section called as International Dawa Training Program. Time is short and uh, we are running out of time. Inshallah, we will just take one more question before we end the session. It's a question from again a revert. The name is Rahul Godaria from India, Mumbai. I am 23 years old. My question is, why does the Quran say there is benefit in alcohol in Surah Baqarah, Ayah 219? What kind of benefit it has? Also, I have been practicing Islam since last one year. I want to learn more about Islam. Inshallah, if you want to know more about Islam, you can watch our Peace TV. It's in four different languages, English, Urdu, Bangla, Chinese. You can visit our website. You'll have a lot of information, inshallah. It will help you come closer to Islam. Regarding a basic question, why does the Quran say in Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse 219, that in the alcohol there are some benefits? What benefit can there be in alcohol? Is the question. Allah says in the glorious Quran in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2, verse 219, that in the alcohol there is benefit and loss. But the loss is more than the benefit. So this verse is giving us the indication that in the alcohol there is benefit and loss, but the loss is more than benefit. That's why Allah says in the Quran in Surah Maida chapter 5 verse number 90, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, O you who believe, Inna mal khamru wal maisuru, most certainly intoxicants and gambling, wal anzabu wal azlamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, rish summin amali shaitan, these are Satan's handiwork. First anibula lukum tuflihun, abstain from this handiwork that may prosper. Here, Allah is telling that the alcohol is a Satan's handiwork, abstain from it. It's haram. But in the earlier verse of Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 219, it says, in the alcohol there is some benefits and also loss. But the loss is more than benefit. I think a medical doctor, I know that there are some benefits. For example, if you have alcohol in moderate levels, it will help you in heart diseases. But the doctor says there is a risk. There's another research which says that if you have alcohol in moderate levels, it will prevent you from ischemic heart diseases. It will be beneficial. Another, result, another research says that moderate levels of alcohol, if you are suffering from diabetes, would be a benefit for you. But all these benefits that I mentioned, it has a caveat. It is very risky because all the doctors and even I and even the medical fraternity knows that alcohol has got a variety of diseases. You can give a lecture for a full day only talking about the diseases. If you go to my answer on alcohol, only listing the disease takes time. So the also liver can, can damage the brain, can damage the, the liver, can damage the lungs, can damage almost all the organs of the body. And every year, two and a half million people die only because of alcohol, according to WHO. So that's the reason. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is 
telling openly that in the alcohol there is benefit and loss but the loss more than benefit so don't have alcohol say you know some people say if you have alcohol it keeps you warm so you know if, if i'm feeling cold why don't i have beer and they are right alcohol keeps you warm but the chances of the other negative factors you being having having other diseases is very detrimental if you start having to keep you cold very soon you will become alcoholic you will be an addict even honey keeps you warm so i would request have honey it's keep you warmer than beer and has benefits for human beings rather than any loss so you should take you should utilize substitutes don't go for these small benefits as allah says the loss is more than benefit therefore abstain from it. it's a certain hand work and we have to abstain from it i'm sorry i'd love to continue and i don't know how many have i answered maybe 20 or more I'm, i haven't kept a track of it but inshallah we'll try our level best i'd like to thank all the viewers for spending all your valuable time with me and asking lovely questions we uh, i wish i could have answered all but it's impossible inshallah if some of the questions we will scan and find it better and exclusive we may ask it next time and take more questions and answer as many as we can and my request to all the viewers is that do pray for me especially in this month of ramadan and i pray to allah subhanahu wa taala that may he forgive all our sins and may he raise all of us in jannah al firdaus wa akhir da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin